You guys are probably asking yourself, what does that have to do with anything about today's message on missions? Nothing. It's just cool. I was gone this last week, as many of you know, doing that. The guy that was out there literally playing with the 345,000 volts was me. I had to go to a training all this last week in Texas um, doing just that. I figured I would share that with you to show you why I was playing a hooky from Bible study this week. As you probably gained from our worship, don't you feel like you've already had church? Holy moly. What a great warm-up. What a great uh, time of worship that we had this morning. As you probably got a hint, we're going to talk about missions today and what's our responsibility as the church. And I'm going to challenge you a little bit this morning because we tend to separate missions into this New Testament thing. And we kind of separate it out from the Word of God. But I would contest that if we remove missions and God's heart for the world from the Bible, we would just have the covers left. The Bible speaks about mission to Gentiles in the Old Testament. A lot of people say, no, there's only about a half a dozen verses in the New Testament and that speaks to missions. And I hope before we get done today that you realize that that's absolutely not true. God's call to missions is cover to cover in that Bible. And not just to the, to the nation of Israel, but to the Gentile folks, you and me, to all the nations of the world. So it's an, it is a New Testament concept, but it's also an Old Testament concept, do the whole Word of God. So those of you that, that uh, were blessed last week to be in Pastor Ken's sermon, he told us about Abraham and Abraham's obedience to God, to the point where he took his son Isaac up on the hill to sacrifice him. He took him up and they prepared and they made an altar and he bound his son. Abraham had a great heart for God and he showed his he showed that in his actions. He showed it in his obedience. So Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham, which we call the Abrahamic covenant today. And this covenant, he uh, told Abraham that all the people of earth will be blessed through him. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, we see a call to Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country your people, and your father's household to the land, I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Church, that's a blessing. That's a promise. Right? Israel was clearly being asked to play a key role in God's world mission. So, God changed Abram's name. If you see in that, it was Abram. He changes it to Abraham. And we see that in Genesis 17. And this emphasizes the blessing and the promise. The future generations in widening circles would be blessed through his descendants. God told Abraham... Again, that he was going to change his name, and he changes his name to Abraham from Abram. Well, Abraham means father of many nations, so it's even in his name. God also told him that he was being offered an everlasting covenant. If you remember in a lot of our teachings, a covenant is the strongest bond, the strongest connection that we see in the Bible. God also told him that uh, not only himself, but through his descendants, this would happen. And the, the Genesis narrative continues of this promised blessing of the people that, that weren't just limited to Abraham's time. So we're going to move to Genesis 26, 3 and 4. God is now speaking to Isaac, the same one that was taken up to the mountain. This is Abraham's son. Stay in the land for a while, and I will be with you, and you, and I will be with you, and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to Father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and will give you them all and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations, all nations on earth will be blessed. 
To Abraham's son Isaac, God promised, through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. So we continue to Genesis 28. God speaks to Isaac's son, Jacob, third generation now. Genesis 28, 13 through 15. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you. Wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. That land that he's speaking of is where Pastor Ken just came back. And they do now occupy the land that was promised. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that here in the future. But our God is a promise keeper. God blessed Abraham and his descendants, both biological and spiritual, so that they would be a blessing to the world. For the sake of time, let's jump to the New Testament and see how Jesus Christ is introduced in Matthew. Matthew 1.1 tells us, it'll be up here on your screen, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This is the direct connection between Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the Abrahamic covenant of the Old Testament that we just saw. The Apostle Paul came to the same conclusion from the beginning. The Abrahamic covenant was meant to include Gentiles, those that are non-Jews. To the churches of Galatia, Paul wrote, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So Matthew tells us, in fact, that Jesus even sought, was sought by Gentiles at his birth. If you remember, the Magi's came to see him from the east. The area where Jesus grew up is commonly known as Galilee of the Gentiles. Jesus proclaimed, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. There's a common thing. The promised Messiah started and ended his ministry with words about people. You see, he started his ministry with God so loved the world. In John 3.16. And then as his ministry was drawing to a close, in Matthew 24.14, he says this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Jesus Christ left us with a command in Matthew 28. We call it the Great Commission, and this is a foundational verse in the Church of the Nazarene. So in Matthew 28, starting in verse 16, I think you have 18 up here. I'm going to read a couple before. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then starting in 18, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That book is one of our Gospels. So it's altogether fitting that the closing emphasis should be on the evangelization of all people of the world. All people everywhere. Alex Deasley, who is a Nazarene Theological Seminary professor, said, There is no gospel without mission, and there is no mission without gospel. That's powerful. There is no gospel without mission, and there is no mission without gospel. 
God's purpose in giving Abraham the covenant and then calling its fulfillment into the Great Commission that we just read is to bring glory to himself through relationships. Caring relationships with people from every nation, every tongue, every tribe, all over the world. So if we're obeying the Great Commission, we have to go out. And we have to put a priority. The church, and I'm not talking about Aztec Church of the Nazarene, but we fall into the global church. The global church has to put a priority on missions. Some of you are old enough to remember this old TV show. And over the years, there's been several movies made with the same title, Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible was about a small group of secret agents. And they went by the initials IMF. IMF stands for the Impossible Missions Force. They were assigned to go against crime lords and evil dictators, and they conducted missions all over the world. Every episode started the same way. They would gather somewhere in public, and they would locate these instructions, and they would listen to the instructions, and they started like this. Your mission, should you decide to accept it. And then the instructions were given, and at the end of the message it said, this tape will self-destruct in five seconds. The group, this impossible missions force, were sent on a mission somewhere in the world. But you see, they could either accept it or not accept it. They had a choice. So do you and I. And I hope you see, with the content that we've gone through thus far, that the Bible is a book about mission to the world. We are called to God's mission. You and I, when we accept Him, we accept that command. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, is the Great Commission, Matthew 28, that we just read. Given to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Mark's Gospel. Go into all the world and preach the Gospel. If you notice, He said, go. You can't take the go out of Gospel. It's written in. Go is in the gospel. That's what mission is. I've had the opportunity to travel the world and go on mission trips, many mission trips outside the United States. You see, before I actually went overseas, my view of the world was very tight and narrow. Being from the U.S., I always thought God was an American God. I always thought he was one of us. He spoke our slang. He smiled down on our green chili fields. Right? He, he loved our worship music. He didn't understand other people's music. He was an American guy. <laughs> but going outside the United States showed me his heart for the world. His big, huge embrace that he has for the world. And it made a difference on me. Now we call it missions. A lot of times it'll be called mission. We've taken the S off the end. Jesus called it fishing. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. My dad, who's here with us today, is a master fly fisherman. And he passed that on to me. He taught me to fish. I even made a living as a fly fishing guy going through college. And as I guided, I rubbed elbows with some of the best fly fishermen in the world that came right out here. And I discovered something about those people who really love fly fishing. If you ask those people who really love fly fishing, okay, would you rather fish a river that has been fished over and over, day after day, month after month, year after year, thousands of people jump over one another to fish it, or would you rather go to an out-of-the-way place, a place with difficult terrain that's hard to get to? It may be hot. You might even have to camp outside. But the fishing is awesome, and they bite over there, and it's beautiful. It's an amazing place to go fishing. Every true, purest fly fisherman that I know would say, I'll take option number two each and every time. That's what missions is. I've never yet met a missionary in the field who didn't have an absolute love for being there because they saw what God was doing, and they saw what God was doing through them. For others. You've seen that bumper sticker, I'd rather be fishing. Our God would rather you be fishing too. He would rather have you fishing for souls 
and fishing for men. We're going to take a look at Acts chapter 1. We're going to go from verses 1 through 8, so get prepared to get there. If you're willing and able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Acts 1, 1 through 8. It'll also be on your screen if you don't have a Bible with you. Jesus taken up to heaven. In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. You may be seated. This morning I basically have two points about missions. Missions are global. And our mission is possible. I'm going to give you a, free re a few reasons of why it's global. We have the responsibility to spread the gospel to our families, to the Four Corners community, to our cities and towns, and to our country. So don't get me wrong, I don't say forsake this place for that place. We have a responsibility. But our vision for evangelism should be further than just our family and our city and our country. It's global for four reasons, and I'm going to give those to you. Number one, because the character of God himself. You can't read the Bible without discovering that our God is a missionary God. He sends people. I think of Isaiah the prophet 2,700 some odd years ago when he heard the, vo the voice of the Lord saying, Who will I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Probably the first missionary in the Bible was Abraham. You see, God told him, leave your family, leave your home. Go to that place, I will show you. And he went. What was the purpose for him going? Well, according to Genesis 12, which we read, so that in you all the families of earth may be blessed. All the nations, all the people. And that's the, that's missions. Right? That's the purpose of missions right there. So all the people will be blessed. You see, the ultimate purpose is to bless the world through Jesus Christ, which was Abraham's descendant. God is ascending God. Furthermore, Jesus Christ himself was a missionary. He left heaven, came to earth with a purpose, to seek and save the lost. And his mission, by the way, was cross-cultural mission. Imagine leaving the glory of heaven to come to earth. That's cross-cultural ministry. Jesus himself left the comforts of heaven, his heavenly home, to come to earth on a mission for you and me. So the Father and Son were involved in missions. Well, so was the Holy Spirit. Sixty-six times in the book of Acts that we read from, it mentions the Holy Spirit, who's sending people through what did we hear? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. The book of Acts continues this pattern 
In Acts chapter 2, there's a missionary event. Sometimes we don't look at it that way, but Pentecost. People from all over the world convened in Jerusalem. They heard the gospel. Their lives were changed. And they went back to their culture bearing the good news. They took it with them. So because of the character of God and his global vision, and his vision for sending people out, and Jesus coming with the global intent of the saving of the world, our mission is global. The number two reason, the second reason, because of the condition of the harvest, the world. The condition of the harvest of people that are soul sick, people that are searching for hope. That's how Paul described it without God in this world. Hopeless, soul sick people. Do you remember when Jesus was at the Sea of Galilee and he looked over the crowd that had gathered in Matthew 9? He saw the multitudes. And he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And then he said to the disciples, and we heard this earlier, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into the harvest field. Jesus saw that there was a lot of people and they were weary and scattered. Or as one translation puts it, and I like this, they were exhausted by their troubles and their long and aimless wanderings. Today there's almost 8 billion, with a B, people in the world. 8 billion people. And of those 8 billion people, so many are lost. They don't know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Because of the character of God, and because of the condition of the harvest, the church must never become a blessing club. We can never turn our activities inward just for our members. It can't be about us. Our vision must be outward, and it must be global. The third reason why missions should be global is because of what Jesus said. And truly for me, this is the only reason that matters. This is the only reason we need. Jesus commissioned us. You see, he commissioned you and me. It was Christ who said, go. Go into the world and preach the gospel. And in verse 8 of Acts 1, To, the utter, to that uttermost parts of the earth, or as our translation says, to the ends of the earth. That's where we're to go. That's not just them, that's us. That's where we're to go. The gospel message, according to Jesus, was for the whole world, not just a few, not just the nation of Israel, for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When the angel first showed up at Bethlehem, do you remember what he said? We talk about it every Christmas. I come to bring you tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. Not just for Westerners, not just New Mexicans, not just Americans all people. And here's why. When a person with a disease, treatment for that disease is the same no matter what culture. When they found a cure for leprosy, that cure could be given to people in America, people in Africa, people in Argentina. No matter where they lived, no matter what culture, they could receive the treatment. If a person has a heart condition or a lung disease and they require treatment for a medical condition or they require vaccines, it's a universal application is what they call it. It can be given to anyone. So that's what it is with the gospel as well. What's the universal cure for sin? Jesus Christ. It's for the whole world. In our great position, our Jehovah Rapha, our God, tells us to go into the world and preach the gospel. So because of the character of God, because of the condition of the harvest, 
because of the commission, the great commission that Jesus gave us. But there's a fourth reason. We in the church forget about this reason. Because of the coming judgment. There is a coming judgment. And it's real. There is a time when evangelism will be no longer possible. Think about that. Worship is for eternity. Yet evangelism has a window. There's a time when evangelism will be no longer possible because God will ultimately and finally come to judge the world. Let's look again at Acts 1, verse 8. The verse there right next to that, verse 9, says, Now when he had spoken these things while they, they as the disciples, watched, he, Jesus, was taken up, and a cloud received him, and he went out of sight. That's the ascension. And while they walked steadfastly towards heaven, and he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Can you picture this scene? Jesus died and then he was resurrected. And when he was resurrected, those hopeless disciples, the hopeless disciples were totally excited. You know, he's alive. They never wanted him to leave. He spent about a month and a half with them, and then he took them up to the Mount of Olives. And they just watched him whoosh as he went. They stood there dumbfounded. Can you imagine? And then these two angels come over and just kind of tap him on the shoulder, say, um, uh, excuse me. But they had a message. Don't be so distracted with this. Just like you were distracted with the kingdom coming to Israel. The same Jesus you saw leave will come again. And when he returns, he'll judge. The second coming of Christ, at the same point in the future, is when Jesus comes on a white horse, his eyes aflame, and the sword comes out of his mouth that is the word of God. His vesture, which means robe, is dipped in blood. And the Bible says, in righteousness he will judge and make war. So in between the first coming and the second coming, we have this period of time for mission. We have this time in history where we can preach the gospel to all of the world. Because there's coming a day when he'll come again. And when he comes again, the world will be judged and the mission will be over. The opportunity for evangelism will be gone. Well, no wonder Jesus was so emotionally compassionate for that crowd that he saw coming towards him at Galilee. Because he knew their present condition. They were weary and scattered. But he also understood their ultimate condition. That's why he said, the harvest is great, the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest, will send out laborers into the field. You see, Jesus knew the ultimate consequences of people trusting in him. And so must we. You see, we're going to take this thing globally if we really believe that. If we could just see the world the way that the Bible sees the world. You see, God's vision of the gospel is much bigger. And he wants our vision of the gospel to be much bigger. We have such a tight and narrow view. Mine was for many years, to be honest with you. It was about my career. It was about my job. It was about my home. It was about my family. It was about my deal. Ultimately, it was all about me, myself, and I. 
And God's saying, I want you to see my deal. He wants you to understand his deal. And his deal is global. His deal is all the people of the world, all the nations, all the tongues, all the tribes. He said, I love the world. And you know what? He still does. Our mission is possible. This mission he's given us is possible. Mission Impossible was all about the impossible missions force. But you're on God's team. When you accept him, you're on his team. Amen? This is possible. This mission is possible. And his book, his book is about mission from cover to cover. Now you might be thinking, Pastor Denver, you've given us a pretty bleak, a pretty dark picture of the condition of the world. And it is. Eight billion people, unsaved everywhere. That is true. How is global evangelism possible? There's two requirements. The first requirement is the filling of the Holy Spirit. As Pastor Ken so eloquently prayed for us during our time of worship in Psalm, this is a requirement. The filling of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look again at verse 8. I hope that we understand this verse by the end of the day because I think it's been up there about four times. That should mean read it, pay attention to it. Don't miss the prerequisite. But you shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. You see the relationship between being a witness to all, all of the world, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the only way we can do that. You see, it's not a human endeavor. It's not an earthly human undertaking, it's a spiritual undertaking. And it requires spiritual equipping. We can't do this on our own. Did you ever wonder how the first disciples could make such a dent in their culture? You had a bunch of fishermen and some others that made an impact on spiritual Judaism and secular paganism in a short period of time of some 30 years. It must be the power of the Holy Spirit. It had to be. That's it. By the way, the theme of the book of Acts, that's what it is. As I said previously, 66 times the Holy Spirit is mentioned. The prerequisite number one, being filled with the Holy Spirit, our mission is possible. The second one is followers of Christ become fishermen. Now let's go back to the metaphor that Jesus used. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Okay, so those disciples, those apostles, those twelve that he was speaking to, what were they before they were disciples? Many of them were fishermen. But in a spiritual sense, they were fish. Jesus came, he casted the net, and he caught them. And he said, follow me. Now they were saved. Now they were following him. Spiritually, they were fish. But Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. And when followers of Christ become fishers for Christ, let's put that another way. When the saved become sent, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, the mission is possible. That's God's plan. Save them, turn them loose, filled with the Holy Spirit in whatever culture, whatever situation, wherever they live, whether at home or abroad, and it's possible. I'd like to have the worship team come back up. So, your mission, should you choose to accept it, the possible mission force through the filling of the Holy Spirit, is to go into the world and preach the gospel. But church, will you accept it? Maybe you'll say, well, I'm not cut out for that. 
That could be true. But I guarantee you there's those in this room that have a calling in their life to mission. They have a calling on their life to step outside of here and go to the ends of the earth. Maybe your calling that God has given you isn't to go to the end of the earth. We're not all called to go there. Each and every one of us has a unique calling. But I guarantee you, if we're called to Christ, each and every one of us is called. But maybe your calling is to help send people that have a call to go. Maybe it's to support them financially. Maybe it's to pray for them. But I guarantee you we can all do something. Each and every one of us gathered here today can do something. We can partner together. You see, in 1963, it took two hours to hear that JFK had been killed. In 1999, it took two minutes for the world to know that JFK Jr. had died. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ stepped out from heaven. And he came to earth and died for our sins. The sins of mankind. And half the world still hasn't heard. So we've got to ramp this thing up a little bit. Years ago, Coca-Cola said that by the year 2000, everyone would taste Coca-Cola. They didn't achieve that, but you should also know that 97% of the world has heard of Coca-Cola. 72% of the world has seen a Coca-Cola. 51% of the world has tasted a Coca-Cola. How long has Coke been around? 100 years. Christians have been around for 2,000 years. And Jesus told us, go into all the world. That's our mission. You see, we're on a mission from God. William Carey, fantastic missionary in the 1790s, came up with a mission slogan that I feel is just applicable today as it was then. And he said, expect great things from God. Have great expectation. We should. Attempt great things for God. We should. <coughs> so, expect great things from God and attempt great things from God. Church, I think God's call to mission is clear. He wants us to take salvation to the ends of the earth. And we are to be a blessing to all people. What great things are you going to attempt for God? What great things are you going to attempt within your family? What great things are you going to do in your community? What great things are you going to do in the world? I hope you walk out of here with the understanding that the call is clear. Don't forsake here for there. Because we're to spread salt and light all over the world, here and there. Church, may he bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he give you peace. God bless all of you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.